Well, good morning. Happy Easter. And uh, we are, yeah, hopefully this morning goes well and doesn't feel too uh, strange everybody being stuck in their homes, but we are happy that we can connect in this way still, at least. So, um, Easter is, you know, one of those holidays, obviously, that we talk about every single year. It's this holiday where we celebrate newness of life. We celebrate the goodness of God. So as we get started this morning, I would like to begin by praying today and helping us to recognize his presence. So Father, I pray your blessing upon today. I pray, I pray your blessing upon all of us in the body of Christ. We are in a difficult season in our world, in our nation right now. And so Father, I pray that you would just speak peace that you would just speak care. And this morning, as we take a look at the Easter story and the resurrection of your son, Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would continue to call us forward into the future that you have for us. Continue to give us hope and, uh, and, and the promise of good things to come in you, Lord. So be with us this morning. Help us to hear from you as we look at the story in Scripture. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as we look at the Easter story, it's um, difficult to talk about Easter without also talking about the crucifixion. And so I want to give a little bit of context this morning to the larger conversation. Last week, Pastor Steve shared a story about Palm Sunday, which is the name that we give to the Sunday when Jesus and the disciples came to the city of Jerusalem and they were received with praise and and rejoicing in the palm branches and things like that that began the week that we refer to as the week of passion. And during the course of that week, Jesus spent time in the temple courts, preaching in the temple, talking to people, sharing time with Uh, with the Jewish folks of that day and teaching them. And then at the end of the week, they celebrated together the Passover meal. And we usually refer to it today as the Last Supper, that he and the disciples in the upper room broke bread and shared the wine, and he talked about, hinted at what was going to come, even though the disciples weren't quite understanding. So after the sharing of the meal, they went outside and they spent time in the Garden of Gethsemane praying that evening, late at night, And then in the middle of the night, after they had finished praying, um, Jesus was arrested. The the religious leaders of the day, the Sanhedrin, the council sent some armed guards led by Judas to go arrest Jesus. They brought him to take, uh, to stand trial before the Sanhedrin. And of course it was, you know, the, the, the gospels record that it was a bit of a farce of a trial. And then early that morning, because see at the time, the Jewish people were not governing themselves. They were under the rulership of the Roman government. And they were not in a position, there were certain things legally that they didn't have the authority to do for themselves. And critically, one of the things that they couldn't do was they couldn't decide to execute the death penalty on anyone. In order to get permission for that, they had to take the accused to the Roman governor, and the Roman governor had to pass sentencing at that point. So at that time, the Roman leader was a man named Pontius Pilate. So early in the morning, the Jewish leaders take Jesus bound to Pilate, and they say, this man has broken the law. You know, there were a number of charges that they brought before him, and they said, Pilate, please pass judgment on this man and schedule him for execution today. And Pilate didn't really want to. In fact, he found out where Jesus was from, the northern portion of Israel, which was under the jurisdiction of somebody else, a man named King Herod. And Pilate said, oh, I'm going to send him to Herod, and I'll let Herod deal with this. And so he sends him to Herod, and, and the, the record, it would be a little bit humorous if the whole story weren't so tragic at this point, because Herod hears that Jesus is coming to him, and he actually gets excited, because he's heard of this person, Jesus, and the miracles that surround him, and the events surrounding his life, and he thinks he's going to get a chance to see the miracle worker, and he treats it almost like a magic show at this point, and he has no real perspective on the, the gravity of this moment that Jesus is in, and what's going on. And so Jesus comes before Herod. Herod is hoping to be entertained almost. And Jesus does nothing, of course. Says nothing, doesn't defend himself. And Herod is disappointed. Misses the, like I said, misses the gravity of the moment. Misses how heavy this space and this time is. And he sends him back to Pilate. He says, oh, I can't be bothered to deal with this right now. Go back to Pilate. And so Pilate then goes through the process, as we know from the story, it, uh, he, he finally caves in to the Jewish leadership, and he says, fine, I will allow this man to be executed. And there's the moment where he washes his hands, and he says, the guilt of this decision is not on me. Let it be on you at this point. And he sends Jesus out to be crucified. So there's the carrying of the cross to the hill, there's the crucifixion event itself, and then Jesus' death that afternoon. 
And these details are recorded in the Gospels. And then afterward, we get this beautiful story about a man who appreciated and loved Jesus. And even though he was being executed as a criminal, he didn't want his body to be treated like a criminal's body. And so he asks and is given permission to take Jesus' body down and to place it in his own tomb, a tomb that he had purchased for himself, obviously, for the future when he would pass away. And he gives it to Jesus. And he buries him. And that's kind of where we pick up the story this morning, this picture of the crucifixion leading to Easter morning. And I wanted to talk about a few things because there are so many conversations intertwined with the crucifixion and the resurrection and the story of Jesus as it's told. But one of the conversations that we have to keep in mind, that we have to keep a good perspective on, is the idea of why this was all necessary. What was the point? And in order to start that conversation, I want to take us back briefly to the very beginning of the Bible, to the book of Genesis. Because the book of Genesis paints this picture of God's creation of mankind, Adam and Eve, in this garden, in this space where he enjoyed relationship with them, closeness with them, connection with them. And they lived in this place of unity and agreement with each other. And then as we know, as the story goes in chapter 3 of Genesis, the serpent comes and there's this moment of deception where God had given Adam and Eve some boundaries, some guidelines, some restrictions. And he had said, I'm giving you these for your benefit, for your health. And the serpent came along and in this moment of deception, he has a conversation with Adam and Eve where he basically ends up saying, did God really say that? Are you sure that the guidelines and the restrictions that he's given you are the best thing for you, are really for your benefit? Or is it possible that if you did this differently, maybe you could find a better good than the one that God is offering to you right now? And as the story goes in Genesis chapter 3, it says Eve and Adam right there with her looked at the tree. They saw this forbidden fruit that God had said, don't eat this. And it says they saw that it was good for eating and good for gaining wisdom. And they made the decision to pursue that. And in this moment, they were presented with an opportunity to agree with God and what he was offering to them, or an opportunity to pursue what they saw as their own good for themselves. And the rest of the history of the Bible is the story of that, of the fall being reiterated over and over again. The story of humanity struggling, wrestling with that same dilemma. Here is what God is offering me, but I really want to do my own thing. I really want to pursue this thing that I can see, the good that I understand for myself right now. I think I can do this better than God himself can. And it starts off in the Old Testament sort of famously with the the books of the law and this collection of lists of do's and don'ts. Because when you're teaching people morality, when you're teaching kids how to live well, that's where you start. You begin with behavior. You teach them what to do and what not to do. But as they grow, eventually you find that the lists aren't as helpful, that things need to change and develop and grow. And so through the course of Scripture, we come you know, to the New Testament where the Jewish people find out that the lists of do's and don'ts are not enough to help them understand righteousness. They're not enough to help restore what had been lost in the garden. Something more was needed, a greater healing. The prophet Isaiah says it this way, in chapter 53, starting in verse 5. But he, talking about Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so we see this picture of mankind's struggle to agree with God, to live in unity with him. And this back and forth, as Isaiah says, we're sort of like sheep, but it also says that the death of Jesus was the healing that was needed to bring this restoration back. Because you see, learning how to agree with God is hard. It's difficult. It's easy to sometimes to recognize, oh yeah, the thing that God is offering me, the future that he's calling me to, the good that he's offering, yeah, that's great. But sometimes agreeing with him is very difficult. It might lead toward a future good, but in the meantime, in the middle of the moment, sometimes it involves difficulty. It involves hardship. I will promise you, following God is not always the easiest thing to do. Sometimes it hurts. Because as good as it is, the fact remains Agreement with God is what led to the cross. 
Agreement with God is what led Jesus to be tortured and crucified. I mentioned earlier that he spent time in the Garden of Gethsemane, and that moment in the Garden is what this is all about. Jesus is there praying and wrestling. In that moment, looking forward at his future, saying, God, I know what you're calling me to. I know what you have in store. I know that this is going to lead to a greater good, to the best possible good. But this moment right in front of me is not going to be any fun. And I really, really don't want to do this. And I get that. I understand that moment strongly. That makes a lot of sense to me. And Jesus stays in the garden, stays in that place of talking with God in this back and forth of saying, I want to agree with you, God, but I'm having a hard time right now. I am going to need help. And of course, at the end of that time of prayer, he comes to this moment where he is able to say, Father, if there's any other way to do this, please let me know. But if there isn't, I will set my desires down in this moment and I will agree with you. And I will walk into this thing that you were calling me toward. Because the truth is, That agreement with God does lead sometimes to the cross and that moment for Jesus. But the good news is that agreement with God is also what led to the resurrection. It is also what led to three days later Jesus coming back to life from the tomb and walking out. If you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 24. I would like to read the Gospel of Luke and its depiction of the resurrection morning and how that went. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1, it says this. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and then on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they, the apostles, did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. And that makes sense in the moment. I can imagine putting myself in the disciples' shoes right here and the confusion they would have been feeling and the confusion that they would have been dealing with, because this agreement that they saw Jesus walking through didn't make any sense to them. Jesus was on the same page with God, but the disciples were struggling. And even in this moment, as they they start to become aware of the resurrection, they're confused. And I get it. The disciples' whole world had been centered on this person of Jesus. They had followed this man for three and a half years. They had these expectations of who he was going to be and what he was going to do. Everything went through Jesus for them. And when he died, when that was taken away, their world crumbled. I find myself sympathizing with them quite a bit this year. Some of you are already aware of my story and the church's story. But earlier this year, January 26th, uh, my father died very suddenly of a heart attack. And my father, Pastor David Lanning, was the pastor of our church He was our leader. He was the guy that we followed. He was the guy that we loved. He, in many ways, was the central anchor piece for my life and for a lot of other people here at the church. And he was gone very unexpectedly. And in the aftermath of that, I understand how the disciples, a little piece of how they would have felt at this moment, the confusion, the loss, the sense of absence, The sense of here was this person, here was this man who I loved and so much of my life went through him. As a church, so much of our lives went through him. He was this focal point for us and now he's no longer with us. And we're left in this place of confusion, of hurt, of loss, very similar to what the disciples were experiencing at this time as well. And the disciples responded to this understandably by sort of going back 
to their old expectations and what they had wanted and the dreams that they had set out for themselves and saying, all right, God, we got to find a way to go back and make the old thing happen still. Pastor Steve talked last week about their expectations and what they were hoping for. Because see, for the disciples and the people of that day, so much of their hope in Jesus had been a political hope. There had been an understanding that the the Christ, the Messiah, that Jesus would come back to set them free from Roman governance and to give them their own nation back. And so when that didn't happen, and when Jesus died, they saw the shattering of that dream, the loss of that dream and the confusion following. So now in the events after the resurrection, as they start hearing, wait, Jesus might be back. Something new might be happening. They kept going back to the old dream. They didn't want God to resurrect something new, they wanted God to resurrect something old. They wanted restoration to what was. And I'll be honest, that makes a lot of sense to me right now. We are in a season of time for our, not just for our church and for my family, but our nation right now, where we are dealing with this pandemic, with the coronavirus, that is, it's bad news. People are dying. This is hard. This is difficult. And there have been a lot of days where I have looked back and said, gee, I really wish we could go back to the way that things were before this. I really wish that we could go back. And even for myself in the life of the church, there have been many moments where I've thought, I wish I could go back to when dad was still here, when he was still with us. So I understand the disciples' struggle at this moment. They didn't understand that the resurrection of Jesus was bringing something new, something better, and something desperately necessary for them at that time. In the aftermath of the resurrection, the Gospels record a number of stories where Jesus in his resurrected body comes back to them and spends time with them and talks to them and brings them comfort. And I want to read one this morning. There's a story that is somewhat familiar from Luke 24, where there are two of the disciples walking on the road to a city called Emmaus. And Jesus meets them on the road. And at first, they don't recognize him. He physically looks the same, but there's something about the nature of the moment and the circumstances that they're in. They don't recognize him right away. And they have this conversation. And as part of the conversation, Jesus begins talking to them because they've been lamenting the events And Jesus' response is interesting to me. He picks it up in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 25. He says this, And Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And we start seeing this interesting pattern repeat where Jesus meets the disciples in all these moments and he helps them understand why the events of his death were necessary, but he doesn't explain them away. That's one of the craziest things to me about this story is that they're in this moment of confusion, of loss, of hurt and grief. And Jesus comes and he spends time with them. He brings them comfort. He eats with them. He speaks to them, but he does not deliver them out of that place. He leaves them in the confusion, in the sense of loss. He lets them stay there in the waiting. And I think that sometimes there's a danger for us. I know for me right now, in the story of my dad's passing and for our nation right now in dealing with this virus, there's a a desire, a strong desire, I, I felt it myself, to find a way to just get over it. To find a way to get through this season of time and just get it over with and have it done with. And I understand that. It's strong in me. The grief process afterward, there's this sense for myself of, okay, if I can just get my grieving done and then move on with my life. But beloved, there is sometimes something holy about those moments and something holy about the waiting in that space and not rushing those seasons and those times. There is this temptation to explain away the tragedy, and we have to resist that. Jesus comes to them, and he helps to encourage them, he helps to comfort them, but he lets them stay in that tragedy, in that space. Over a period of 40 days, he spends time with them, he speaks to them, he cares for them. And I think that's very similar to the tension that we're in right now. 
There's a portion of the Gospels in Scripture where it describes the disciples and how they were behaving and how they were functioning afterward, and it talks about them hiding in their homes behind locked doors. In their case, it was because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. But I read that passage, and it rung a lot of bells with me because for so many of us right now, we're waiting in our homes, hiding behind locked doors because we're afraid of what's outside of our homes. Rightfully so, just as they were. And it's this beautiful picture because Jesus right past the locked doors, right through the walls, just appears in their midst. And we're getting an opportunity to experience that today, this morning, that Jesus is entering our homes and being with us. Church is you today. In your home, where you are, Easter service is with you, and Jesus is there with you as well. Because the truth is this. They might have been waiting and hoping to go backward, but God was still dedicated to calling them forward to this new thing. They were stuck in a pattern of identifying their own good and of asking God to agree with them. And God was saying, we're still headed somewhere in the middle of this. There is still a future and a hope that I'm going to walk you toward. Jesus didn't explain why it all happened. He didn't deliver them from the waiting tension. He explained that it was necessary, that it had to happen, and then he let them stay there, but he told them to wait for the revelation that God was going to bring. He said, stay in Jerusalem and wait because God is going to come and he is going to move and he is going to speak. He met the middle, in the middle of their space, he brought them comfort and then he gave them instructions to wait. And after he gave them those instructions, there's this event that we in the church refer to as the ascension where Jesus is taken back up to heaven. But I want to read from Acts chapter 1, where he gives them these final instructions. Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 3, says this, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And part of the key here is realizing that what they needed was revelation. They were getting hung up on the past and their own expectations, their own conception of what good was and the plan that God had for them. And God was saying, all right, guys, I need you to set that down for a second. And I need you to talk to me and agree with me. There we go. We lost our picture for a second. (laughs) And God kept calling them forward and saying, I know what you're hoping for. I know what you're expecting, but wait. And Jesus said, wait, there is a good coming. You see, because the story of Christianity, the story of scripture is this story of of death and rebirth. The story of the old passing away and God bringing this newness over and over again. We see these pictures where the Hebrew people are in slavery in Egypt And there's a death that happens. And then afterward, they're set free and there's this newness of life. And they go through a season of time of the wandering in the wilderness and that's a death for them. And then there is a newness as they are ushered into the land that God had promised to them. And they go through this cycle over and over and over again of loss and of death into something new, into the revelation of what God has for them. And beloved, we're in a very, very similar time right now. The promises were already there for the disciples. The scripture had been written. The scripture had been given to them. Jesus had spoken. God had spoken. But they couldn't see it for themselves. They were so stuck in the old, so stuck in what they wanted that they couldn't see the promises. And they needed this moment where God was going to speak and where God was going to come in power. They didn't know it, but they were headed straight for the day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost is this event that we refer to in the church that happens about a week or so after Jesus leaves and he ascends back to heaven where the disciples are gathered together and God pours out supernatural power on the lives of the disciples and they go out from that place and they spread the gospel and they preach and people are healed and people are saved. It's amazing to me because you read the story and, and, and if you back up on a macro level, you kind of It's easy to look at it and say, well, Jesus is the central figure. He's the one who should be leading this charge, right? Three and a half years of ministry, and his ministry stays in the nation of Israel. It doesn't go anywhere else to a relatively small group of people. 
And it is after he dies and after he leaves that it explodes and that life happens and that newness happens. Within one generation after the life of Jesus, the gospel is carried to the entire Roman world. It covers every part of civilization as they knew it at that time. It reaches everybody. Jesus had to die and had to go back to heaven to be with the Father before the new thing that God wanted to do could be brought to fruition. Beloved, we are in a season of loss right now. We're in a season of hardship much as the disciples were going through. Grief, confusion, and the strong desire to explain away our current hardships. But we have to remember that we are headed for our own day of Pentecost. I don't know when it's coming. I don't know what the timing is. I would love to know. I would love to be able to stand here and say, because according to the calendar, we're going to celebrate Pentecost on May 31st of this year. And I would love to say May 31st, everything's going to get resolved. And the new thing that God is doing is going to be here and it's going to be happening. I don't know what his timing is. The waiting always takes longer than I want it to. The waiting is always harder than I want it to be. But the promise is that God is calling us toward something new something better. He is calling us toward new life. He is calling us toward resurrection and rebirth and the plan that he has for us in the future. So that's the question for us this morning. What's the promise? What is he speaking into reality for our future? It's not going to be a resurrection of the old thing. As much as there are days where I want that to be the truth, he is not calling us to relive the old thing. That death and rebirth cycle that we see throughout the course of scripture, that we see echoed throughout life, results in something very different than what used to be there. Frogs don't look a lot like tadpoles. Butterflies don't look a lot like caterpillars. New life very rarely looks exactly like the life that came before it. But it is always what we are being called into. Christianity is filled with this, life is filled with this, and we are living it right now. So what is God calling us to agree with today? What's the future that he's laying out before us And where is he asking us to partner with him today? What is he calling us into? I want to take a few minutes to end the service today by praying with everyone. And I want to pray for a couple of things. First off, I want to pray for those of us who are already believers, who who have experienced that restoration in life with God. I want us to take a moment and to ask God, what is the newness that he's calling us into? Maybe it's not supposed to be here yet. Maybe what he's calling us to right now is to stay in that waiting to stay in that sense of loss and grief, and maybe what he wants to bring is comfort. Maybe what he wants to speak this morning is peace. Or maybe he wants to start revealing some of those promises, and he wants to start giving us a perspective on the future and where he's heading and what we can hope for and what we can hang on to. And in a moment, I want to pray for that. But I also want to pray for for the folks who may be watching this morning who don't feel like they have any kind of a connection with God, who sort of feel like you're still left in that Genesis 3 garden space where the brokenness has happened and you haven't experienced the healing and the restoration of God bringing you back to that place of relating with him and hearing from him and experiencing life with him. You still feel like you're struggling to agree. And I want to take some time to pray for that as well, to give you an opportunity to respond. So let's pray this morning. God, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for Easter and the promise of Easter and the picture of what you are doing. Jesus' death was absolutely tragic, yes, in every way. And it was also necessary that it happened. And those two things don't cancel each other out. They get to coexist. And Father, we're in a space and time right now where we are experiencing tragedy on a lot of different levels and hardship on a lot of different levels. And just knowing that there is a good in store for us in the future is not enough to make those hardships go away. And it's not supposed to be enough to make those hardships go away. God, there is something holy about this moment, this season that we are in right now, about the waiting for you. So Father, I pray that as a church, as a nation, while we are in this moment of waiting, while we're in this moment of grief and loss and confusion, that you would meet us there and give us comfort. God, that you would appear in our homes, that you would sit with us, that you would speak. I don't ask for you to explain it all away. I don't ask for you to make sense of all of the confusion. I just ask, God, for you to speak, to give us comfort, to remind us that you are there, you are with us, and that you are hurting with us. 
You are a God who is well acquainted with suffering. You know what it's like to hurt. And in those spaces, God, I pray for your comfort. I pray for your peace. And Lord, I pray for your voice and for revelation. I do pray, Lord, that you begin to speak to us. Give us a perspective on what you have in store. Even if we can't see the connection, the path between where we are now and what you're calling us to, Father, that's okay. Start to give us hope for what is coming, for what the new life can look like that you are bringing to bear in this season. Start to give us a vision for that day of Pentecost where you pour out your spirit and where you start to do the new thing and you start to bring that sense of rebirth, God. Speak to us this morning. Tell us what to agree with. Tell us how we can stand with you and partner with you, God. Even if it's just to stay and wait longer in your presence, God, give us something to agree with today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And Father, I want to continue praying this morning. For those of us who are, for those who are joining us today, you know, by, by video, who, who don't feel like they have any kind of a history with you and experience with you, nothing that they would point to and say, yeah, I've, I've related to God before. I've heard his voice. I felt like he's been speaking to me. But that sounds like something that I'm interested in. God, I speak to us this morning. It's funny because as a pastor and a minister, I have such a history with people being in the room and asking for responses and saying, you know what, if you're interested in relating to God, raise your hand or stand up or something like that. And <laughs> can't really do that this morning. So Father, here's my prayer today. That if there are people who want to know you, God, I pray that you would be there with them. That you would sit with them, that you would speak. And that you would bring what they need, whether it's a sense of having heard your voice or just an overwhelming sense of your peace and the emotional care that comes with being in your presence, Lord, that they would experience you today and that you would say to them, I want this. I want closeness with you. I don't want you to feel far away from me. I want to help you learn how to set down those expectations and agree with the good that I'm laying out for you because it is good. You are a good God. Be with us this morning, Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If that's you in this space this morning, if you're in that position of really wanting to initiate a relationship with God, wanting to understand what that can look like, my encouragement is um, let us know. We have on the church's website, springfieldfaithcenter.org, there's a link, and I think Jeremy's going to put it on the Facebook page as well right now, where we have a prayer request form that you can fill out and it'll send it to us so that we know what the needs of the church are and how to be praying. But if that's you, if you're in that space this morning where you want to start a relationship with God, where you want to understand what that looks like, fill out that form and just let us know and we'll follow up with you sometime later this week just to have a conversation and to talk you through that process and to help initiate some kind of a relationship and a connection to us. Beloved church, it is a strange season. These are interesting times. And in the middle of these times, we get to trust in the promise that God is still good, that he is still himself, that he is still sovereign and in control, and that he is calling us forward to something good, to the promised day of Pentecost and the new rebirth that is coming next. We get to look forward to, we get to hope in and trust in. That's our challenge for today as we finish out Easter. Be well, love each other, take care of each other, wash your hands, stay safe, and trust that God is going to speak and give us something to agree with. Be well. Have a good Easter.